Hey everybody, this is Christian Buckley doing another MVP Buzz Chat. I'm talking today with Aiden. Hello. Hi there, how are you? I'm doing well. And for folks that don't know you, you've been a long time in the space. Um, but for folks that don't know you, who are you, where are you, and what do you do? Uh, well, I'm Aiden Finn, and I'm a 16-year MVP. I am in North Kildare in Ireland. Um, so if you look over to Europe... Uh, the westernmost little teeny tiny island is Ireland, and I'm on the east coast, about a half, depending on traffic, between half an hour and an hour and a half from Dublin. And what do I do? I am a principal consultant uh, for a Nordic consulting company, so I work remotely. It's nice working in the cloud. And I'm here in my office at home. And I'm a Azure consultant, so I work primarily with customers mid to large private sector government who are going through usually messy migrations i get the messy ones that's uh, i spent a lot of my again i came from the sharepoint side and early on i spent a lot of time with clients that had messy migrations and helping fix that in fact i think that's an ongoing anybody who works in the sharepoint space there continues to be a uh, a lot of opportunity in helping <laughs> clients clean up yeah, I, I get a lot of that. So, for example, uh, I see all this chatter about Azure Migrate. I never get to use Azure Migrate um, because the situations are usually beyond the capabilities of any of the migration tools out there. It's usually very manual rebuild processes. Yeah. Well, uh, so a lot of labor. Well, that's what we, we used to. We came up with phrasing. This is like 10, 11 years ago of full fidelity migration. I'm sure the, 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 the concept is saying like what customers to say, I want to take exactly what I have here in this environment and move it over to the new environment. Exactly like that. It's like, yeah, it doesn't quite work like that. Uh, yeah, it's I, nothing like that for me. Yeah. Um, Cause I'm usually, I usually get the customer where we can't touch the original equipment because it's in some shared hosting platform um, with multiple tenants sharing the same physical hosts. Or there's outdated operating systems that aren't supported in Azure, um, or the customers made you know a, a, a fair decision to dump VMs and go to platform. Um, so we're usually looking at replatforming, rearchitecture, rebuilding OSs, dealing with ISVs, gets you know, old versions of software replaced with new versions of software or figuring out how do we get something that used to run on 2008 to run on you know, 2019 or 2022 yeah. um, or, you know, will it even support PaaS at all? Um, so, yeah, usually lots of interesting conversations. Well, my, my, again, my, my entrance into the Microsoft ecosystem right at the beginning was uh, doing, uh, um, you know, IBM uh, uh, migrations, migrations, over to uh, SharePoint and Exchange. Um, so again, it was just, there was no migration. That was the, the secret. It was, you're going in and recreating. Oh, from so Domino to Microsoft. All of that. You know, Domino on the you back were, end. You were the most popular person with the users and least popular person in IT. <laughs> Lotus, Lotus Notes. No, no, actually, I mean, users, the IT, they were, it was the opposite. I, the IT yeah. generally were supportive, like help us. And it was the users that weren't happy with the experience. I mean, Lotus uh, Notes, part of the problem with it is that you had all these, uh, you know, user created database, small applications, which is kind of like power platform, you know, it, yeah. so they were just tied to that. And there was no mapping of those things over to the new solution. So it was usually from the top down saying, we're going to move off of this away from this. We want, so we're going to have to re-architect all these different solutions, help us to, to do that. And end users were fighting it. Yeah. Wow. Well, you think about it, we're really uh, doing CCOE. Cloud center of excellence. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, yeah. Before the coin, the term was coined. Right. Well, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's a, a, again, I, I look at this thing. I, I, I started my career in doing data center consolidation. 
So it's all kind of the same thing. I mean, my, mm. I did massive projects where we were upgrading the hardware. We were rolling out little software packages like business objects, uh, you know, doing, doing training of users, um, constantly upgrading uh, the, the capabilities of these, these systems for these I worked for the phone company. And so these were some of the, the, the largest consumer marketing databases and systems um, mm. to reach all of the, I worked in Northern California for those that remember Pacific bell. Um, you worked at pack bell um, were massive projects, um, but it was a great experience to go through and learn about change management and uh, the the low tolerance that most organizations have for change, uh, so it was a it was a great learning experience. Yeah, yeah, that would have been. Not many people have those war stories. Yeah, it it's uh, well when you've been doing IT, I've been uh, so I've been doing this for thirty three years, and so most of when people come in, it's like, did you have an example of, of like this situation? I was like, uh, I've got a few stories for whatever situation you could throw at me. So, so what, so I, we were talking before we started recording too. So I know for 16 years, um, Azure wasn't around 16 years ago. So what was kind of your path? What were, when did you, when you originally became an MVP, what was that process like? Oh, wow. Um, so way back when, probably 2003, 2004, um, I was working for a finance company. Um, so it would, a German owned finance company that had its headquarters in Dublin and later went on to try take part in the takedown of the world economy um but uh, that's a different story speaking of war stories um and microsoft uh ireland became aware that i was you know doing some bleeding edge stuff and asked me to come in uh to their offices and do some presentations and the technical account manager we had said, hey, have you heard of this thing called the MVP program? I said, no. He said, yeah, maybe I might nominate you for that, you know, based on some of the presentation stuff you've done for us. And I said, okay, that's cool. And at the same time, I started, you know, going online and using support forums and stuff like that. And there's one forum I used to go to. So those of us who've been around in the Windows world long enough might remember the name Mark Manassi. And Mark was, you know, a very well-known uh, author in the Windows space and a presenter at you know the big conferences, uh, particularly in the US, so the tech ads and stuff like that, and Win Connections. Mm -hmm. um, and I got onto his forum. I got to know a bunch of the people on there, and a bunch of them were MVPs. And I was like, "Ooh, these people are really smart. Uh, this this MVP thing must be good." And I was submitted. I didn't get in because I really didn't have the content. Um, so some of your uh, watchers may know that become an MVP, you really have to have a year of solid content, right. community contributions. That's uh, right. It's where a, you're, for people, you're not making any profit. Too, it's, it's an award for community contributions. And they look at only the last year. I mean, you may have been on fire three years ago. Irrelevant. Yeah. It's the last year. Yeah. And that impacts your renewals. Yep. Um, so every year you have to continue to contribute to the community to stay in the program and answer the relevant technologies for your expertise. Right. Um, so I, I, I had that in the back of my head. And a few years later, um, I started doing um, some presenting. Uh, so I was asked by Microsoft Ireland to start up a user group for Windows Server. Um, and I started you know, doing a lot of presenting at that because I couldn't get other presenters. And I started doing a bit of blogging and I started to try to raise my own profile when I went out on my own. And I found myself doing a lot of system center configuration stuff. Uh, so system center configuration management. And I got nominated. Um, so two different people nominated me and I was accepted. And it was funny because when I got the notification that I was accepted, I'd stopped doing all the desktop management stuff. Hmm. And I'd moved exclusively into server stuff, particularly virtualization. And I'd, I'd made a decision that I wanted to find a technology that was emerging and wasn't yet established. And the established virtualization platform out there was VMware. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I wanted something new. So what did I jump on? I jumped on Hyper-V. Mm -hmm. 
And realistically, because of my system center background, Hyper-V was a natural fit at the time um, because I liked how it integrated with the system center uh, vision. And I was a real advocate for what system center was capable of doing at the time. So I jumped on Hyper-V and I was using it in a startup posting company. So I was, I was finding all the problems and I was trying to solve them. And I know I was sharing what I was learning. And it was a small community, particularly in Europe, because mm-hmm. VMware had basically taken over America. Because yep. um, America had jumped on virtualization before Europe had. Um, and VMware was the only, op- you know, the only player, really. It was some other stuff, but VMware were the only player. But when virtualization took off in Europe, Microsoft had something. Mm-hmm. Now, it wasn't great. But it was good enough for a lot of us. And it, it got there by the time 2012 came around, mm-hmm. uh, particularly 2012 or two. Um, but I, I started writing and blogging. And then I asked to be moved into the Hyper-V uh, expertise area based on my content. And I was accepted in. And that's a great group. Um, they're still there. They're not called Hyper-V anymore. Haven't been called Hyper-V in a long time. But they think of themselves as the Hyper-V people. Mm-hmm. Um, and th- there's related technologies that uh, that group um, would have close contacts with. Um, so, for example, Arc, um, so Azure Arc um, for the hybrid stuff and uh, the file services and the failover clustering guys. Mm-hmm. Um, so all together kind of you know, make it a tight unit for the, the, the on-premise alternative or extension to Azure today. Um, so I was in there and I wrote books. Um, so I've done, f- I, I've been a part of five books, really one of those, I, I did the intro stuff and I handed over to the other guys who knew the stuff mm-hmm. better than me. Um, but I did two Hyper-V books and one of them, uh, which was the 2012 or two book, um, we were really chuffed with that. And I think the best compliment we got was from one of the, the senior PMs of Hyper-V who said, you know, I get given all these Hyper-V books and I never look at any of them. <laughs> because I, I can't just come out and say, I like this one or I don't like yeah. that one or whatever. Yeah. I can't be seen to do that. But I was bored one day and your book just happened. I was sitting on the kitchen table and I opened up, it randomly landed on this networking chapter, which was like nearly 100 pages long. And I read the 100 pages I thought, I don't know that. That's really cool. I don't know that. Oh, that's really cool. And he, and he said, I actually reached out to my, one of my uh, junior PMs and said, buy a bunch of these books for all our new employees to come into the team. And yeah. That's what they did. And she actually left that comment on the review of the book on Amazon. That's awesome. Was like, you know, that's, that, yeah, that's yeah. a touchdown right there. Yeah. Um, so I was, I was delighted with that. Um, and then... Uh, my my work changed. My day job impacts what I do on my, con- uh, my, my community stuff. I'm one of these right. people. I have to be working with it to be able to talk about it. I can't just yeah. say I'm going to submit a session and then I'll learn about it for the session. Right. Because I won't know the content and I won't be comfortable on the stage um, or in front of the camera I, I or whatever I wish more people would follow that practice, but yes. Yeah. Especially in the era uh, of AI and Copilot, I wish people oh. would take that to heart <laughs> yeah and it's it's one of the things like like i've put together a session on how to deliver better te- technical sessions mm-hmm. and it's one of the, the the things i try to say to people is in theory anyone can be a presenter if you talk about something you know about and you enjoy working with and you've you've learned the basics and you know a couple of really advanced things that you'd like to share or a couple of cool tricks you can present that thing yeah. and and uh, that's the approach i like to take is I like to know something and then I present on it. And of course, my day job changed when Microsoft Ireland once again impacted my life, came into my uh, employer. And at the time I was working in distribution. So I was, my job was I was technical sales lead for a distributor here in Ireland um, well, who sells to 70% of the partner market here in Ireland. Mm-hmm. They dominate the market. Mm-hmm. And Microsoft Ireland came in and said, right, we need Aiden to stop talking about Windows Server, Hyper-V, and System Center. Now, we need them to start talking about Azure. We need them to take the lead with the partners and get them to start doing Azure work. Yeah. And I was like, oh, boy, I haven't even ever signed into Azure at this point. This is the first day of January after the, you know, the Christmas break. And I was like, oh, boy, this is going to be fun. 
Um, so after the meeting, I talked to my boss and I was like, right, I need an Azure subscription or something. I think that's what I need. Um, I think that's what it's called. And I need to sign in and start learning this thing. And that's what I did. I, I, I started building out. I just thought, what's the best thing to build here? Well, an RDP farm seemed like the best thing to build. So I built all the bits, the domain controllers, the RDP servers, the gateway access servers, and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Built it all up, got the thing working. And I was like, okay, I've learned some stuff here. I've learned some networking. Um, never been the networking guy before. I knew what I needed, but on-prem, I was the server guy. And the systems management guy I was never the networking guy, but I've had to build the networking myself because it's a self-service environment. That was kind of cool. And it's like, I learned and I learned and I learned. And I focused on the, at that time in that job, I focused on the small, medium business market. You know, the technologies that I thought would, they would adopt straight away. So I focused on the hybrid stuff like backup and site recovery, which turned out they weren't interested in uh, site recovery backup. They loved. Uh, and then I, I, you know, always had VMs and the infrastructure stuff, you know, taking point solutions, moving them to the cloud. Mm -hmm. um, and looking at RDS and stuff like that. And that's what I kind of built upon. And then five years ago last week, I changed jobs. I moved from that Irish company to a Nordic. And um, so for people who don't know Nordic, it is Finland, Denmark, Sweden, and Norway. Um, so the company I work for is headquartered out of Finland, um, but I work for the Norwegian branch. And... I travel there once, maybe twice a year. It was once last year. Um, all my work is on Teams and Visual Studio Code and the Azure portal. And I work from here in Ireland. Um, and uh, it's basically I work with mid to large customers, government customers, um, doing, as I said earlier, usually the messy migrations. Yeah. And I've become kind of the networking guy. Um, so a lot of my my community stuff lately has been networking. So Azure that's networking. That was, that was what I was going to ask. It's like, what are you what are you writing about, talking about right now? Um, Azure networking is kind of because I do a lot of it. Mm -hmm. um, when you're doing migrations, a lot of your effort tends to be around IaaS. So there's a lot of VMs, mm -hmm. um, but. I, I I also have customers who basically, I had one government customer who said, we're banning IaaS, <laughs> which I always laugh at because they always end up needing VMs even to support their PaaS stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the last customer I spent a year and a half working with um, were primarily going PaaS, but they wanted everything secure. And that's usually our sales pitch is coming in, doing governance and security. And security means taking things off the the public front end and putting onto a network. And um, so it's sitting behind, you know, whether it's a network firewall or a web application firewall mm -hmm. and making those databases and those app services and all those other things, you know, private and only sharing what you need to share to the public and making sure everything's inspected and logged and, you know, governed and cost managed and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so networking is a big part of that. Um, and that's taking up a lot of my time. And that's what I've been writing about a lot lately. It's a lot of the presentations I do at conferences or user groups tend to be around networking, but I'm also trying to branch out beyond that. Um, so work lately, I've you know, been spending some time looking at uh, Azure Open AI. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, that's interesting. I'm trying to find especially trying to find the free time to be able to look at that stuff. Yeah. I've got um, a good friend that's been pushing me to look into that stuff too. And uh, look, I don't have the, uh, I don't have the, uh, the background as you, I'm, I'm a, essentially, I'm a marketing guy. I've been in products, yeah. you know, most, most of my career, uh, the second half of my career. Um, but uh, it's funny talking with a buddy who's you know, huge in Azure and, and, and AI and has a startup that's an AI startup doing a lot of interesting things. And, starting to tell him about you know what i'd like to do with copilot it's like christian you don't need copilot for the stuff you're talking about you know the azure ai stuff you can go in and build this like you can yeah you can go in and you just need to go explore just take half a day go in poke around you will have something built by the afternoon uh and and so it's just yeah 
finding half a day to go explore that's that's what i don't have i think it's a little more than a half a day really um but yeah. yeah um like you'll spend countless hours just reading and then it's you know experimenting and finding where that doesn't work the way i thought it was going to and yeah. um playing around with it is you know a, and experimenting and learning from failure is a big thing mm-hmm. um and you know reinvention you know, you've, you've kind of alluded to it yourself in your own career. Reinvention is part of an IT career if you're going to be around a while. Yeah. Um, I, I'd say I've, I've reinvented my career at least three times so far. Um, you know, I started off as a developer on Unix. Mm-hmm. Um, that was my education at college. I was a C and a C++ developer. That had also done some COBOL and Pascal, <laughs> um, but I was primarily a C developer. Um, and I landed in a job working for an American corporation. It was Japanese owned, <laughs> isn't corporate stuff funny? Um, you know, doing C on Unix and then my project died and accidentally I fell into the windows world because I'd gone on some basic windows training to port our code to windows mm-hmm. and was a product consultant for years, found myself unemployable, um, and realized while I'm in Windows world, I need to get myself employable. I became an MCSE. Um, and those of us old enough remember what that used to mean. Uh, that was that was the rubber stamp on your resume saying you are worth a decent amount of money. Yeah. Um, so I had that and was working in a really interesting finance company I mentioned earlier, um, building out and migrating all the global offices um, to the latest of everything. Mm-hmm. And I was leading the charge on that, and that was fun. Um, and then I went through that virtualization transition. Um, so I switched over from being you know, this general Windows guy to, all right, I'm moving into this virtualization space and the systems management space, become a community member and a presenter and a trainer and stuff like that. And then, you know, I had that fateful morning meeting with Microsoft Ireland where I was told I needed to start working with Azure. Yeah. So all the on-prem stuff was like, and all the Azure stuff that I used to talk down and say, you can't do that. The Americans are spying on us. <laughs> Suddenly, no, they're not spying on us. It's fine. <laughs> well, it's mostly true, yes. <laughs> uh, but what you don't know does won't hurt you. you know? Yeah. Yeah. So- well, so one last question for you, because I, I, I always like on the community uh, side of things, like, so how are your community activities? What's what's happened in the community over in, in Ireland, like uh, your local community? Oh, uh, local, it's not great for us. Um, um, so there's not a whole lot that goes on here. Mm-hmm. Um, so most of my contributions are either online or international. Um, so I've bunch of things out there for this year um waiting to hear back you know how that is there's always a batch of sessionized yep. things that you do at the end Floating of the year and it's like <laughs> yeah and, and, and most of them the, the the organizers never respond to it and then you realize well that event just went by and they go back it's like i never got rejected no they're just still sitting there yeah yeah you you you've, you'll find a, a bunch of that and and a bunch of different online things pop up every now and then um, so I've one that I've been asked um, if I'll do, um, and it's actually from a local organization. So um, I do a few of those. There's a cool group out of the UK and Ireland, uh, MVPs, who do this uh, festive uh, tech calendar thing. Hmm. Um, so over the holiday period, um, they basically build up a catalog of content so it's like having an advent calendar and oh. you come in you open up their page and they have a bunch of links to different things it could be live sessions it could it literally varies from poetry to hmm. <laughs> live sessions blog posts video recordings you name it excuse me <coughs> oh, talking too long um so lots and lots of stuff so i did that um I have a bunch of different things out there as well for this year um, that I'm hoping to hear back on some of them, you know, even in the second half of the year. Yeah. Uh, so one of them is actually in America. Um, so it's the first time I felt comfortable in a few years going that far um, to do community stuff because I have a young family. Yeah. So uh, are you coming wife... over for summit? 
I am, yeah. I'm looking forward to that. Um, so I was there last year. Yeah. And as you know, last year was crazy because it was all short minimize. notice. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. minimize and everyone was scattered everywhere. And I, I, you know, with all that, I still I tell people, I mean, I always tell, especially new MVPs coming on, I said, I, I think it is the number one perk of being an MVP is participation in that because, uh, you know, there are, uh, you know, the friendships and connections that you'll make that are yeah. invaluable to your career. Yeah, um, absolutely. And, and, and so just, it's, it's not even about what the sessions are, what they're presenting. It's about the interaction. I love hearing the questions. Like, I didn't even think to ask that uh, mm-hmm. you know, to the product teams and like, wow, what's that scenario? Who is that person? Like go have those conversations as well as with the product team. Yeah. So, I've, I've, I've observed that. I've also observed the one where someone goes, why doesn't this work? And then someone over that side of the room goes, actually, I figured I had to make that work. Let's chat. Yeah. Yep. Um, and then there's the, like you said, there's the, the friendships you strike up with people from completely other parts of the world. Yeah. That if you met them in a hallway, you would never have a conversation with them. Yep. And you realize that you have common interests you know in work and then you find out oh we're actually kind of get along or we have common interests yeah. outside of work or whatever it is um like some of those people over the years like i've had them at my wedding um and you know there's some people there's a guy who lives 20 minutes from here i only ever see him at events we usually meet up at the airport. Yeah. We end up traveling there, hanging out there, coming back again. It's, our lives here are totally different. I, I lived in Seattle for 12 years and uh, it, uh, same thing. I would see people. I would only see local people. I was like, you know, I, wife and kids in a life, you know, in a yeah. small town away from Redmond. And, uh, it, but I would see them at events on the other part of the planet and be like, oh, hey. And they live yeah. one town over. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny um, how it is like that. Um, and it's another benefit as well of being at the MVP Summit is getting to know the program managers who are mm-hmm. people who take the feedback to the architects to build the products that we're using. Yep. And getting to know these people outside of the sessions yeah, and having those contacts um, because it's interesting when they realize that you have valuable feedback and you can give it to them in a way that they can use and because they have a very specific way of thinking and talking. Well, and, and that's it. That, that's a great point because it's, it's also important to understand for us to better understand what are the priorities of, of why they're structuring their go to market, their roadmap. Um, Cause they're usually, you know, MVPs go to these things and we have like my list of things I want yeah. to like, why are you not working on this? Why are you not solving this? Or I'm experiencing this issue that's been out there. It's been on the roadmap for two years. What's going on with this? And they'll tell you their priorities and their perspective. It just, it, again, it's, that's the yeah. work. It, it helps you put those things in perspective. Yeah. People don't realize that there's a, a limited amount of capacity that they have. And that was made clear to me. So back when I was a Hyper-V MVP, um, the storage and clustering guys used to invite a small number of us um, to a product planning session with them. Mm -hmm. So we would spend the day with them and we would put down our wish list, big giant whiteboard that wrapped around the room and our wish list would go up there. Mm -hmm. And then they say to, it was probably depending on the year between eight and 15 of us in the room, And then they would go around to us and say, right, you each get to pick one thing from that list, that huge list that wraps around the room. This is the reality of our lives. We have a semester that we can develop in Mm -hmm. and we have to release code in. And we only have so many architects and so many developers. And there's a coordination, cross product coordination. There's, I mean, there's so much. I mean, that's one, that's another thing. I mean, Microsoft is known for, you look at the competitive space. I mean, they've they've really been committed to over Microsoft's life of backwards compatibility of integration cross solutions. And uh, so again, there's a, it's not just a matter of why can't you go build that one little feature? Yeah. Look, I, and I, I'm happy to harp on those things too of the things that I want to see done. Um, but again, it gives you that perspective. 
Yeah, and it's it's not easy. Like for those of us in the Azure space, particularly working on networking, one of the things we keep going back to them with, and I always laugh. I tell them, you know what's coming from me. I'm going to ask you about seeing uh, all the effective routes at the subnet level because I can only see them on the VM NIC, and that's useless when I'm troubleshooting PaaS resources. And they always go, yeah, yeah, yeah. we know, we know, we know. You do realize it's it's not that easy. And I, I, I say to them, yeah, I, I know. I know the problems. I know the complexities because I have a little teeny bit of understanding about what's happening you know, behind the curtain, mm-hmm. uh, how this thing works you know, under the platform. And I can understand that we'd be crossing boundaries to make that work. Mm-hmm. With boundaries we shouldn't be crossing as tenants in a, a multi-tenant cloud. Um, but we got to figure something out. <laughs> because yeah. <laughs> everyone's hurting uh, and you know I, I, I'm, I'm able to accept that they can't just throw that out for us um, and but you've seen it yourself you, it's amazing when you say you know I have this idea and I think it would make this better mm-hmm. and then three months, six months, twelve months whatever it is later you see your feature yeah oh yeah you know having that moment where you just go that's mine <laughs> I remember when release the window. I, I'm just always happy. And one of the um, features everyone talked about, and it was fine. <laughs> I, I'm, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's one thing to, um, and I get this all the time with where you see something or it's explained from Microsoft outwards, like, hey, that I could see how that resolves a scenario or something to the customer. But, uh, you know, I get just as much satisfaction taking the other direction, working with the Microsoft people say, let me tell you this customer scenario. And like, oh, I didn't, you know, they're having yeah. that eye opening. I didn't think of that. I didn't see that before. That's one of those things where I mean, I'm constantly tell customers, partners, especially MVPs, you can't be quiet about sharing that information. You can't just assume that three or four other MVPs have shared that idea yeah. with them. Like get, make sure you report that feedback back and they take that stuff into account. And certainly when there's a groundswell around a feature idea yes. around that, it has to be weight. They take it has to be weight. Action. It can't just right. be interesting. Right. And um, because it, interesting means it ends up low on the stack rank. Right. Because as you said earlier, they have a, a list like this long of things that people have asked for. And they'll say, yeah, there are things we sh- that are valuable and should be on the list. But they can only work on those top few things. Right. And if you want to move your thing up the list, there has to be a groundswell of feedback for it. Now that doesn't always work because sometimes it contradicts, you know, either that group's plans or architecture. Even another I mean, group's plans. Yeah. There's yeah. There there was there was a I, I talk about this once in a while. This is funny. Uh, in business school, uh, we learned about again, it was like a product management uh, focused course where we learned about something called the house of quality. And it's like, it, it's a template. It's, it was created like 30 years ago, 40 years ago, whatever, uh, maybe, maybe even earlier than that, but it was just a way of looking at, you've got your list of the features and you can prioritize them however you want. Um, then there's the effort it takes to go and do the complexity of that. Then there's the, you know, customer demands, money, dollars behind it, all those things. But when you overlay all of those different pieces your priorities are often not what you thought. There mm-hmm. are things which have uh, a seemingly lower rate of return, yet quick turnaround with zero to low cost to do, get those things out, it moves things forward. Other things which just you know, take, take longer. Anyway, looking at that, it, it just, again, I keep using the word perspective. I feel like Kamala Harris, I keep reusing the same word over and over again. But, uh, you know, uh, you know, again, having that perspective of here's what uh, here's what goes into the decisions that are being being made, having those conversations, um, I think going back to the summit, that's where I feel the most, not that I don't feel heard elsewhere in other you know, things like we just had our uh, uh, we had a call yesterday with the MVPs and the M365 category and everybody had a chance to ask questions. There were those empty moments where no one was raising their hand, no one was speaking up kind of thing. So everybody had an opportunity, Um, but I feel so much more heard at those sessions where you literally, after a session's going on, follow the product team out in the hall where you have another side conversation, you're sharing contact information. 
Like, let's schedule a call. Let's go through this in detail. I mean, again, that, that kind of stuff, it's not that it doesn't happen when we're all remote. It just, when you can put a face with the name, it moves faster. It just does. Absolutely. It does. Um, And you'll find, certainly at least I have anyway, um, if you're able to give them interesting information, they want to come back to you. And it could be even a year down the road where they have something they want to talk about and Mm -hmm. they want feedback on it. And they will reach out to you and go, hey, um, we've got something interesting that we're we're thinking about doing. Um, We'd like your opinion on it. I've had a few of those calls over the years, which is kind of cool. And it's also interesting as well from your, I bet you've probably had this experience where you're having a technical challenge and you're getting nowhere with support. You just reach out to the what? relevant that person. That never He's happens. Like, Whoa. I, I happen to know the person who owns that feature. I'll just reach out to them to see if they can, you know, shake well, the tree a little for me. Let me tell you what I miss. So for a few years, um, I had an office on campus. So I worked for this ISV. Oh, yeah. And it was part of, I was a purple badge. And so there was the Microsoft technology that, what was it? It was the, can't remember the name of the building now. Um, I think it was building 26. Anyway, so right on main campus over in the corner, um, we were in the same one that the uh, green badge, the uh, the MSNBC folks that were in that helped support that, whatever. Anyway, I had an office that I shared with another ISV vendor on there, but that purple badge, so I could, if I had a question for the product team, I could literally go and look at the product team person that I've been trying to track down. Oh, they're in a meeting in this building. And I could go sit outside that meeting and wait for them to exit and walk with them to their next meeting and have a conversation. Now, there's a reason of that that kind of stalking and yeah. uh, that kind of hype. Like, I get why Microsoft shut all that down. It was fantastic while it lasted. Yeah. Um, so much great for that. Um, one of the things I like to do as well now, um, I did it last year and I'll, I'll be doing it again this year, is reach out to some of the PMs in advance and say, you know what, I'm going to be around. I know their session's on for the three days or whatever, but I'll make myself available if you're interested in having a, a chat. Yeah. Um, because the chat that I have with you will be more interesting than the session. Yep. And reality is my colleague... Um, who's the sh- same expertise as me is probably going to be sitting in that session. He'll tell me if there's anything interesting I should know about anyway. Um, a lot of Microsoft, the product team people, they make themselves available during the week for exactly those kinds yeah, of things. They travel for us. None of them right. live in Redmond anymore not, not or anywhere anymore. near Redmond. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Agreed. Yeah, it's changed a lot. But, well, but it's they a, travel there for us. I, I know. It, it's a, And a lot of them, unfortunately, it's sad. There's a lot of... Uh, faces that were of all those events but when pandemic and when they the rules changed they were allowed to move away i mean two of my best friends the space that work for microsoft are both down in arizona now and both of them say it's like yeah i don't have the budget i'm i'm not on the list that's being flown back up like so it's sad you don't see all the faces but of course they're happier living in a yeah in in a different place it doesn't rain 300 300 days a year I don't mind that so much. Say so I, I fit in. I miss that, but my wife did, does not miss that. So, but well, Aiden, really appreciate your time and great, great connecting. And maybe doubtful we'll see each other at the MVP Summit. I think we're running in different circles there, but yeah, you never know. Yeah, there's always some of the social stuff that's happening. Yeah, we'll, um, we'll there's see a lot what... of paths that cross there. Yep. Well, thanks so much for your time. And uh, for folks that want to reach out to you, where where are you the most social? Where can people find you? Um, so on Twitter, I'm at Joe underscore Elway. And yes, that is uh, football related. Um, so go Niners. Um, well, born and raised a San Francisco 49er fan. I, I, we're, we're probably moving to Texas in the next year. And I told oh. some friends from Texas, I'm like, you know, I can't ever like the Cowboys. Hey. I, I'm... I'm built Niner, to hate Niners, Cowboys. Cowboys. We're designed to beat them in the playoffs every year. Bang, bang, Niner gang. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, at Joe underscore Elway on Twitter. Um, I'm on LinkedIn as well. So you search for Aiden Finn. So it's A-I-D-A-N-F-I-N-N. You'll find me on LinkedIn. And, of course, I blog on AidenFinn.com. Um, so I'm not that hard to find. Excellent. Well, we'll have all the links, of course, out on the blog, the podcast, and out on the 
on YouTube as well, where the video will be. So, well, thanks so much for your time, Aiden. No problem. Good chat. Wow.